Hey, I'm sorry this has taken me so long. I had hoped to get to it earlier in September, but August and September are pretty crazy for me. The River, that's the story we're going to discuss. How on earth do you talk about this story? Here's how I'm going to do it. I'm going to begin by sharing an essay that was shared with me. If I can find it. Well, here's how we'll do it. I just have to go here, okay? This is Salvation by Langston Hughes. My actress, Hannah, shared it with me. She was very impressed with it. It's very well written. She was impressed at the fact that it, it is a um, sort of a cry of pain against Christian hypocrisy. It is certainly that. In this little essay, Langston Hughes, as an adult, tells, tells the tale of when he was 12 years old and was at a revival. And uh, at this revival, and I'll read here the highlighted part, my aunt told me that when you were saved, you saw a light and something happened to you inside and Jesus came into your life and God was with you from then on. She said you could see and hear and feel Jesus in your soul. I believed her. I had heard a great many old people say the same thing and it seemed to me they ought to know. So I sat there calmly in the hot crowded church waiting for Jesus to come to me. Well, Langston doesn't feel the presence of Jesus. He doesn't see Jesus. There's nothing that moves him. And so he doesn't make the altar call. He sits there and all these other kids go up and the pressure gets more and more intense. And there, be, there comes almost an atmosphere of mass hysteria surrounding the only two boys remaining on the bench. Still, he says, I kept waiting to see Jesus. Finally, all the young people had gone to the altar and were saved, but one boy and me. He was a rounder's son named Wesley. Wesley and I were surrounded by sisters and deacons praying. It was very hot in the church and getting late. Finally, Wesley said to me in a whisper, God damn, I'm tired of sitting here. Let's get up and be saved. So he got up and was saved. And then they all call on the final one. There's no way he can't get off that bench. Langston, 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 why don't you come? Why don't you come and be saved? Oh, Lamb of God, why don't you come? So I got up. Suddenly the whole room broke into a sea of shouting as they saw me rise. Waves of rejoicing swept the place. Women leaped in the air. My aunt threw her arms around me. The minister took me by the hand and led me to the platform. When things quieted down in a hushed silence punctuated by a few ecstatic amens, all the new young lambs were blessed in the name of God. Then joyous singing filled the room. But there's a problem. Langston didn't see, feel, or sense Jesus Christ. He was pressured into making this altar call. This made Hannah very angry. This is why she sent me the story. The rank hypocrisy of Christians. It's everywhere. There's no denying it. It's in our own lives, if we're Christian. And in this case, this poor boy, in a form almost of abuse, is forced into something where he ends up lying. But listen to how it ends. It's kind of the opposite of the end of the river by Flannery O'Connor. That night for the first time in my life, but one, for I was a big boy and 12 years old, I cried. I cried in bed alone and couldn't stop. I buried my head under the quilts, but my aunt heard me. She woke up and told my uncle I was crying because the Holy Ghost had come into my life and because I had seen Jesus, but I was really crying because I couldn't bear to tell her that I had lied, that I had deceived everybody in the church, that I hadn't seen Jesus, and that now I didn't believe there was a Jesus anymore, since he didn't come to help me. I would suggest that Langston Hughes ends up in the Ashfield residence, which is where the story begins. I don't want to be judgmental or hard on him. But the essay, Salvation, by Langston Hughes, ends with a kind of nihilism. 
The implication is there ain't no Jesus because I didn't see him. And I was forced to lie by everyone around me. And yet, if there is no Jesus, why was he crying? Because of the lie. Why was he crying? Because he had been abandoned by Jesus. I would say, as I told Hannah, if Jesus is in that essay, he's in the tears of that 12-year-old boy. Tears shed by a guilty conscience. If there is no God, we can do whatever we want. If there is no God, and if this is a lie, we need to burn down all the churches. Because I don't want to live with a lie, even if it's comforting. I don't want to live with an illusion. I used to think this was a lie and an illusion. Many people in the story we're about to discuss think it's a lie and an illusion. But what Flannery sees that Langston Hughes doesn't is even if you deny Jesus or don't see him, he is there and he makes you unable to turn the tables and set up your own church of Christ without Christ, so to speak. Now let's take a look at this story. There's a lot I could say about it. We begin, and I'll share, and maybe we can actually find the story, if I do this right. What do we find out at the beginning of the story? Well, we're left to kind of try to figure out a way through the mystery, because the story begins in a kind of confusion. We know there's a father getting a young boy dressed in a kind of a negligent way, just shoving his arms into his jacket. There's apparently a mother who calls from another room. He ain't fixed right, a loud voice said from the hall. Well then, for Christ's sake, fix him, the father muttered. Now, this is just a passing moment of profanity. We learn later that the only time the boy whose name we find out later is Harry, though he calls himself Bevel, the only time the boy hears the name Jesus Christ is used in this manner. Like, oh, or God, or Jesus Christ. Too often, that's how the holy name is used. But Flannery's being literal. He ain't fixed right. Well then, for Christ's sake, fix him. Now, the boy is being picked up by a caretaker, and apparently he lives in this kind of neglect. A toneless voice called from the bedroom, bring me an ice pack. Too bad his mama's sick, Mrs. Conan said. What's your trouble? We don't know, he muttered. We'll ask the preacher to pray for. He's healed a lot of folks, the Reverend Bevel Summers. Maybe she ought to see him sometime. Maybe so, he said. We'll see you tonight. And he disappeared into the bedroom and left them to go. We also know they keep abstract art in their house. Mrs. Conan gave the watercolor another look. They went out into the hall and rang for the elevator. I wouldn't have drew it, she said. So we know a lot about the boy in the first two pages. He's growing up an Ashfield. We later learn that's his name in a field of ashes. He's growing up in a wasteland. Later in the story, he dumps the ashtrays out and grinds them into the carpet, a, something that his parents apparently don't even notice because they spend all of their time partying and drinking and not taking care of their son. He is living in a kind of a wasteland and he is a child of neglect. Now, we have, in Langston Hughes' essay, a form of abuse, this 12-year-old boy being forced to lie in order just to get out of a very uncomfortable situation. And we have an enforced Christianity being shoved down his throat. And perhaps, if the boy had been raised in the Conan household, that's how he would have felt. Maybe there would have been an oppression of Christianity as opposed to utter neglect and nihilism. You have a pair of opposites here. 
you have a very sort of faux sophisticated group of yuppies neglectfully raising this boy who is being cared for by these poor women who come and pick him up and take him to their own houses. They don't even want a caretaker to come and be at their apartment or wherever they're living, the Ashfields. They wanna get the kid out of their house and go on with their debauchery. Now, when he gets to the Conins, well, maybe he's gone from the frying pan into the fire. Or as Bilbo says, maybe he's gone from being chased by goblins to being chased by wolves. So maybe it's about the same thing. And yet something's going on in the Christian household that we cannot as readers completely dismiss. For one thing, the caretaker cares for him. He doesn't even have a handkerchief. He put his hands in his pockets and pretended to look for it while she waited. Some people don't care how they send one off, she murmured to her reflection in the coffee shop window. You provide. Who's she talking to? God. Deus, Deus providibunt, or whatever it is. God will provide, which comes from the story of Abraham and Isaac. You provide. And then she provides. She gives him a handkerchief. He blows his nose. You can bury it. You can keep it since you've blown your nose into it. His parents don't even send him out of the house with his nose wiped. And we learn later when he's foraging and scavenging for something to eat for his breakfast the next morning that this kid isn't even fed. He's not fed materially or spiritually. Well, Mrs. Conan, for all her lowbrow, bottom of the rung socioeconomic crassness, is caring for him, at least during the time she has him. Now, he tells her his name is Bevel because he heard her say the name of the preacher. She believes him. He's used to joking. He's used to not, not anything being serious. Nothing is serious for mom and dad. You know people like that. People who live a kind of Ecclesiastes. People who live a life where they're not even really awake to the pleasures they indulge in. All is vanity. Nothing is vanity. There's nothing new under the sun. Everything's a joke as it is to Mr. Paradise. We'll get to him in a minute. Speaking of Mr. Paradise, we know the husband scoffs at the healer. He's gone to the government hospital now, she said, and they've taken one third of his stomach. I tell him he better thank Jesus for what he's got left, but he says he ain't thanking nobody. Honey, they took a third of your stomach because of your cancer, but you still got two thirds left. You better thank Jesus for the two thirds of stomach you got left. I ain't thanking nobody. The Huck Finns that are being raised by Mrs. Conlin need to fulfill some sort of great need that is partly satisfied when they don't do what they want, which is throw Bevel slash Harry into the hog pen, but they get Harry to release a hog. We see here at the end, Ma ain't gonna like him letting out that hog, the smallest one said. Of course, he doesn't let out the hog. They Make him let out the hog. They force him to, the way Langston Hughes was forced to make an altar call for Jesus. But the hog. Get away, Mrs. Conan shouted at the hog. That one yonder favors Mr. Paradise that has the gas station. The hog looks like Mr. Paradise. Okay, Be when Flannery does stuff like this, she's being very deliberate. The hog and Mr. Paradise represent the same thing. Now, when Harry sees these pictures of Jesus and doesn't know what he's looking at in this woman's dilapidated clapboard rundown shanty shack, one of the pictures is of Jesus chasing a load of pigs out of a man. Well, it's Jesus exorcising the demoniac and the demons ask permission to be allowed to take possession of or infest some swine, Jesus allows this and the swine go trampling over the cliff and the townsfolk are so angry at the loss of livestock that they chase Jesus out of their town. 
So we're reminded of that gospel story of the swine and the healing of the demoniac. The swine, pigs are an unclean animal in the Jewish law. And the demons take them over. And there is something demonic about this pig that bowls Harry over and that is identified with Mr. Paradise of all names. We learn a little bit about him. You'll see him today at the healing. He's got the cancer over his ear. He always comes to show he ain't been healed. He's like Mr. Conan. I ain't thanking nobody. The shoat stood squinting a few seconds longer and then moved off slowly. I don't want to see him, Bevel said. Now, we're going to take you to the river. First of all, Bevel, Harry, learns he hasn't been made by the doctor, who doesn't even know his name. He thought that was a joke. Everything in his house is a joke. He's been made by a carpenter named Jesus. But then we meet the real Bevel. Bevel Summers, I'm going to perform a little bit for you. And you're lucky because people pay me top dollar for this. We don't know what to make of Bevel Summers. Is he just a, a nutcase? Does he have a tile loose? Is he only in it for the money? Or is he a kind of prophet? Unhinged, unstable, but somehow doing God's will. A lot of people complain that they don't get healed. He keeps insisting he never promises to heal anybody. He's standing in this red river that looks red in the sunset. Flannery is always deliberate about these kind of details. Then he lifted up his arms and shouted, this 19-year-old itinerant preacher. Listen to what I got to say, you people. There ain't but one river, and that's the river of life made out of Jesus' blood. That's the river you have to lay your pain in, in the river of faith, in the river of life, in the river of love, in the rich red river of Jesus' blood, you people. His voice grew soft and musical. All the rivers come from that one river and go back to it like it was the ocean sea. And if you believe you can lay your pain in that river and get rid of it, because that's the river that was made to carry sin. It's a river full of pain itself. Pain itself. Moving toward the kingdom of Christ to be washed away. Slow, you people. Slow is this here old red water river round my feet. As this here old red water river round my feet. It's a river of pain. Whether you believe in Jesus Christ or not, the idea behind the crucifixion is God takes on the pain of suffering humanity and the sin of suffering and sinful humanity. The blood of Jesus is the blood of our pain. He unites with our pain, he draws us up and unites with his. In the water that spills from his side, in addition to the blood, we are washed in this river of blood. Now that's baptism. Langston Hughes may not feel it if it comes in the form of an altar call. Langston Hughes may be disappointed that he's never seen Jesus. He may not see him in his own tears, which, if you look closely, are probably tinged with a red like the red of this river, the blood of our Savior. Tears shed by a guilty conscience by a, a boy who believes there is no meaning in the world, and you are forced to lie, even if you don't want to. Either this is the river of Christ's blood, or it isn't. And so, when he is challenged, and I'm going to go back and share, and we'll take a look at the text again, the crazy woman gets in the river and it doesn't seem to help her. 
She's been that way for 13 years. A rough voice shouted. Pass the hat and give this kid his money. That's what he's here for. The shout directed out to the boy in the river came from a huge old man who sat like a humped stone on the bumper of a long ancient gray automobile, Mr. Paradise. He had on a gray hat that was turned down over one ear and up over the other to expose a purple bulge on his left temple. He wants to display the fact that he has not been healed. He's a scoffer. Remember the pig? The pig had a partially missing ear. He sat bent forward with his hands hanging between his knees and his small eyes half closed. Bebel stared at him once and then moved into the folds of Mr. Mrs. Conan's coat and hid himself. Bevel has a natural and instinctive fear of Mr. Paradise. The boy in the river glanced at the old man quickly and raised his fist. This is the preacher. Believe Jesus or the devil, he cried. Testify to one or the other. Flannery doesn't always put devil characters in her stories. We can probably eventually say that Mr. Paradise is one. But of course, we sympathize with the scoffing. After all, the devil speaks truth. Sometimes he is a liar and the father of lies, but he'll quote scripture if he has to, as he does to Jesus when tempting him in the desert. It's not beyond the devil to point out the truth. Or it's not beyond the devil to speak to our doubts. Who is this kid? Does he just want money? This kid ain't no faith healer. Look at the cancer above my ear. Look at the crazy woman who's just as crazy as she was the first time she came to this river months ago. This isn't working and I'm not thankful for nothing or nobody. That's a demonic voice. Mr. Paradise may not be the devil per se, but that is a demonic voice because there are two choices in this story. Maybe, there, maybe it's a false dichotomy. I don't think it is. There's the Ashfield place and there's the Conan place, which ultimately is the river. There's either the neglect and lack of meaning where everything's a joke. You scoff at everything, where the name Jesus Christ is a curse word only. When they find the book that Harry has stolen, they only value it at the Ashfield place because it's a collector's item. They're wise enough to know a valuable piece of artifact when they find one, a book from 1832. They don't value it because of the content. They value its market worth. Well, we do have a baptism here. I'll go back to me. I'm gonna try not to take much longer with this story, after all. I'm talking about it longer than it would take you to read it. Listen, Mrs. Conan said, have you ever been baptized, Bevel? He only grinned. I suspect he ain't ever been baptized, Mrs. Conan said, raising her eyebrows at the preacher. Swing him over here, the preacher said, and took a stride forward and caught him. He held him in the crook of his arm and looked at the grinning face. Bevel rolled his eyes in a comical way and thrust his face forward. Everything's a joke. That's how he's been raised. Close to the preachers. My name is Bevel. Which it's not, he said in a loud, deep voice and let the tip of his tongue slide across his mouth. It's almost the ape of God staring at the preacher. Imagine what the preacher thinks at this moment. This little boy mocking him, aping him, this twisted reflection as in a funhouse mirror. That needs to be exorcised from Harry. The preacher didn't smile. He knows better. His bony face was rigid and his narrow gray eyes reflected the almost colorless sky. Now the sky is almost colorless though it was red at the beginning. Things are getting serious. There was a loud laugh from the old man sitting on the car bumper, Mr. Paradise, and Bevel grasped the back of the preacher's collar and held it tightly. He's scared of that man. The grin had already disappeared from his face. 
he had the sudden feeling that this was not a joke. It may be wrong. It may be a lie. It's not a joke. Where he lived, everything was a joke. From the preacher's face, he knew immediately that nothing the preacher said or did was a joke. And, and it's not like it's wrong to joke. I'm constantly joking. She's not talking about sense of humor. She's talking about that empty, hollow, sarcastic thing that you see on TV. That constant carping at one another. That constant cynical, scoffing at everything in life where nothing has meaning. Everything's a joke. Not to the preacher. This 19-year-old skinny kid, we're not given any real hope that this is the real deal until maybe now. Nothing the preacher said or did was a joke. My mother named me that, he said quickly. Interesting. There's also a kind of identity between the preacher and the boy Harry, who calls himself Bevel. Have you ever been baptized? The preacher asked. What's that? He murmured. If I baptize you, the preacher said, you'll be able to go to the kingdom of Christ. You'll be washed in the river of suffering, son, and you'll go by the deep river of life. Do you want that? A Catholic would understand, as, as Flannery does, that a sacrament is only effective. The grace of the sacrament is only operative if we cooperate with it. It's based both upon the validity of the sacrament itself, the intention of the minister, and the, the, the matter involved, but also upon the intention of the recipient. And so the question is put to him. In infant baptism, it is the godparents who say yes. With baptism at a certain age, it's the baptized who's given the choice. As Mary was, Gabriel didn't say, you're going to be the mother of Jesus Christ. He said, do you want this? And she said yes. And the world turned on a pivot at that moment. Yes, said the child and thought, I won't go back to the apartment then. I'll go under the river. By the end of the story, he goes under the river. Oh, I did all that. I thought I was sharing. It does get confusing. You know, when you're just sitting in a closet with a green screen, trying to talk about a very difficult story. It's hard to remember who you are or what you're doing, especially if you get caught up in it. Is that river the blood of Christ? Does baptism have the effect that the church claims it does? The washing away of sins, the entry into the church, does it draw you as a river slowly toward the kingdom? It's another thing that Langston Hughes wasn't given the opportunity to understand. It's not a question of an altar call only. It's not sola fide, faith only. It's a long, slow river that draws you into a kind of death, but also into an eternal life and a real paradise. I'm not so sure Mr. Paradise is trying to save the life of Harry at the end of the story. At any rate, even if he is, Harry goes under the river because he doesn't want to go back to the wasteland. Harry wants the destination, the kingdom of Christ. Now, either he's wrong, and this is a very modern story that Langston Hughes would be happy with, 
where this poor boy is not old enough to recognize that it's all a lie. Or that river and that blood is real. And that preacher's not joking. And everything back at that hideous yuppie apartment is selfishness, debauchery, emptiness, sin, and a 12-year-old boy who says, there is no Jesus. And my lie is all I've got left. It's one or the other. The preacher tells us that. And Mr. Paradise speaks out. I'm just going to quote that again. Believe Jesus or the devil. Testify to one or the other. A part of what Flannery does is she always gives us room to doubt. We, the, all readers of her stories, would be much more tempted to sympathize with the Ashfields because we're bourgeois. We're not the proletariat scum of the earth, salt of the earth, that the Connons and the itinerant preacher are. So we naturally don't want to believe that the preacher knows what he's talking about because we understand what Langston Hughes went through and how false and hypocritical it all can be. We can make it false. We can be hypocrites. We can lie. But that river is either the blood of Christ or it is not. What's the next story? I don't know. It's the next one in that collection. October is when we'll discuss it. Maybe we'll have a video meeting that many people can join into and they can tell me how wrong I am. I welcome that. Leave your comments. If you disagree with me, disagree with me. We can go back and forth. Thanks to Hannah, my actress, who gave me that essay. Hannah was very moved by it. I was moved by it too, but in a negative way. And this story, what the heck do you make of this story? I hope I helped you. Okay, I guess that's it, kids. See you next time.